we fight about everything. Yeah. Like just about everything. But when you spend 24 hours a day together at the rink, at home, you know, everywhere we go is together, like you're going to fight. But then, you know, five seconds later, we're back to being best friends. And, and then we fight again there five minutes later. So it's like, it's a pretty, it's a funny relationship. <laughs> Welcome to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. I'm your host, Jamie Thomas. Happy 2024 to you. Happy New Year to our listeners and our viewers of this podcast. Not going to talk a whole lot here, which is probably music to your ears, because we have two guests this week, uh, Cole Perfetti of the Winnipeg Jets and Brock McGillis. Still to come, the play of the week. But first, let's get to your favorite moments of 2023. I sent out a post on X or slash Twitter to ask what your favorite Jets moment of 2023 was. Thanks for all the responses. Let's start here. Adam B says there is only one correct answer, October 9th, which, of course, was the day of the announcement for Mark Shifley and Connor Hellebuck's uh, seven-year extensions. Shannon, Shannon sorry, says PLD being shipped to La La Land and getting a positive return with three players. Onid says twin seven-year extensions. And Tarina adds Chevy's trade with LA. Hashtag Chevy for the win. Our first guest of the pod is Jets forward Cole Perfetti with some interesting conversation about his roommate, Dylan Sandberg. Enjoy. Uh, Cole, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, what do you think you've improved upon the most this early on in the end of this, this National Hockey League season? Uh, I would say probably my... Uh you know, play without the puck, I think that's definitely improving a lot. Um, you know, I'm take, trying to take pride in that. And, um, you know, when I don't have the puck, just making sure I'm in the right spot and, um, you know, being an impact still in the game. And um, I definitely think, you know, just my, you know, confidence and comfort with the puck is, is coming a long way, I think. You know, understanding when I can hold on to pucks, when I can't, where, you know, I can make a play and where, you know, I just have to live to fight another day kind of thing. So um, just learning that has been, uh, you know, I definitely think that part of my game has improved. What, what was the thing that you took the longest to adapt to at the National Hockey League level in your, in your mind? I still think it's the speed and the, right. yeah, like so fast, plays happen so fast, you don't really have much time to, um, with the puck and when you do, you, you have to make that decision, you know, right away. And, you know, I don't think anyone ever gets used to the speed. Like, I think it slows down a little bit for you, but, you know, guys are it's, it's just so fast and yeah it's the best players in the world so um yeah I think that's the toughest part to adapt to is just the speed and the size of you know how limited ice there is and and time when you have the puck what's the biggest change to your offseason workout that you I know it was well documented you changed a lot of things this year what was the biggest change in your mind um I don't know I think there's I don't think there's one specific thing I think you know obviously Going with Manny Nickel was huge for me, and um, I think also, you know, just trying the, you know, new things, doing, doing yoga, doing Pilates, doing Aldoa, um, different things that, different, uh, you know, styles of training that I think, you know, I've never really done before, and really focused on certain things that I needed to to work on, and um, yeah, I mean, it was a great summer, and I felt, I feel really good, and still feel really good, and um, you know, coming into camp, I felt amazing, so. Um, I don't think there was one specific thing. It was just mm -hmm. a whole combination of uh, a bunch of different things that were new. Yoga takes a lot of patience. Do you have the patience required, or did you find that it, that was that for was, for yoga? Like oh it yeah, it's it, frustrating. Like it's there's hard. a lot of folks saying hard. <laughs> it doesn't seem it doesn't look like it should be that hard, and then it's such a tough you know it's a tough workout. So um, just kind of something new. You know, everyone you know is you know used to like the basic weight training and. Yeah. conditioning stuff like that and then when you do stuff a little slower you're holding positions for a long time stuff like that like it's it's tiring it's hard so um i don't know if i loved it but i think it definitely helped no, it's, it certainly helps with focus does it not yeah, i think so yeah the mental part of it definitely makes you push through when you don't really want to there's a lot of more. poses like i've done yeah. yoga twice man so i'm quite an expert on the whole thing but the pose the the things you can hold is like it's tough there's a lot of tough stuff, so it's um, downward dog is quite easy. Yeah, that one's an easy one. But there's some, there's some. I think that Aldoa is also really tough. Like you're holding positions for a really long time. And so what? Yeah, what's Aldoa? Like? Well, it's I, a lot of it's for like you know core and back strength. Like it, it's you know strengthening the smaller muscles in your back. Mm -hmm. um, it's like crazy. Um, you're holding positions that are like super uncomfortable to you know for like an extended period of time and 
it gets tedious. It's hard. Um, you know, it's almost like strengthening and, and lengthening your spine kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's tough, but it's, it's good work. What's, what's hard. So rank them in order. What's hardest yoga, Pilates, and Aldoa? Ah, uh, I think they all have different aspects that mm -hmm. are hard about them. I think, you know, the Pilates when you're on the reformer and, um, a lot of core work, those ones suck. I think the, the, you know, yoga is just, you know, everyone kind of knows what yoga is all about. It's, it's, you know, just holding those positions and, and, you know, a lot of burning. Yeah. And then, you know, the Aldoa is just like really hard on, on those small muscles that you don't really use very often, but are so important for creating a strong, you know, spine, creating a strong core, back, whatever it is. Like it, those, you just don't really use those muscles. So it's kind of like you're firing new ones that don't really turn on or, or are used very often. So it's, uh, it's tough. There, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of relationships that build over the years uh, playing hockey. Uh, let's talk about your billet family from Saginaw. They've been a big part of what, you know, of who you are and uh, your growth in, in the game and off the ice. Uh, can you talk about them a little bit? Yeah, they're amazing. You know, I still talk to them once a week, twice a week. My parents talk to them all the time. Like, you know, they came to our, to the game in Florida on American Thanksgiving there and um, came to the game in Detroit. Like, they're, they're, you know, we still talk to them lots. They're huge you know, piece of my life. They're their family now. Um, you know, I was super fortunate and super grateful that I got to live with them for, for two years. And, um, you know, I think a lot, you know, I, I think I had the best billets you could ever imagine. And, um, you know, they were so great to me and, you know, they got a younger son named Cooper who's, right. who's, uh, he's 16 now, but when I moved in, I think he was, he was 10 mm -hmm. or 11, just turned 11. And, uh, you know, we just play a lot of video games. They had a backyard rink that we'd always go out on, you know, he loves hockey so much, and so we got to spend a lot of time together just, you know, whether it was, you know, on the backyard rink or, you know, playing NHL or whatever it was, like, we created a pretty good friendship and good bond, and, um, you know, he's now, you know, he's drafted last year in the OHL, and, um, you know, he's he's turned, he's, a, he's a really good player now, so um, it's cool to see him, you know, grow from a 10-year-old player to where he is now at 16, and um, see him grow as a person and um, just super fortunate for them. What, what's the biggest thing that the, this, this, your Billet family did to help you get, you know, used to being away from home? Because that's the biggest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well. they just they just treated me so well. Like, you know, the meals, the, you know, the setup at the house that I had, the way, you know, they would do anything for me. And, you know, they were so generous and, and helpful and you know, with the, obviously the first couple of days you move away from home and you're living with a family you've never lived with, it's a little weird. But within three, four days, I felt at home and felt comfortable and and didn't feel awkward or weird and and it just felt you know just felt right. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't think a lot of kids have that right away. And you know, I was able to step into a family that was just some of the best people I've ever met. So pretty lucky. Um, everybody has a roommate, and it's, that's. That, there's no doubt about that growing up, but uh, Dylan Sandberg is your roommate. Listen, no question about this. Everybody has something, a little quirk that bothers your roommate. So what is one thing that you and Dylan disagree about often as roommates? There's probably a lot of things. We fight a lot. We're like brothers. Like, yeah. you know, we just, you know, you spend so much time with each other. You just you end up fighting with each other. And What's the number one issue? Uh, maybe food. Yeah. Like in what way? each other's food. Okay. Well, yeah. Like if you're uh, hungry. There's it's whatever's there. Yeah, he uh, he doesn't like to share, so sometimes I'll do it to make him mad, and then you know he'll just grab stuff off my like. So it's just like stuff like that. You know what we're gonna watch on TV? He's a big movie guy, and I, I like watching like sports and like live television. Mm -hmm. And he likes watching like a lot of movies. I don't have the I don't have the patience to sit there and watch tons of movies. So fight about the TV. We fight about everything. Yeah, like just about everything. <laughs> But when you spend 24 hours a day together at the rink, at home, you know, everywhere we go is together, like, you're going to fight. But then, you know, five seconds later, we're back to being best friends. And, and then we fight again there five minutes later. So it's like, it's a pretty, it's a funny relationship. But, um, yeah, he's one of my best friends. So well, what's lucky to live with him. What's, what's the, what, his favorite movie or one of his favorite movies that you just oh, absolutely he's got can't everything. stand? He's got everything. He's known, he knows every single movie, every mm. quote. So, like, useless he's information. Got an, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Animated movies, like, documentary. Like, you name it, he's seen it. Like, he knows every movie and all these lines. And then, 
the one thing that it bothers me the most is when we're watching a movie and he uh, he really may, wants you to pay attention, mm -hmm. especially if it's a movie that he likes. Will he pause so, it? So, like, if I'll go on my phone mm -hmm. for, like, five seconds, he'll, like, pause the movie and go, like, what just happened? I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I looked is, there a, is there a quiz on looked this Looked away for five seconds, and then he goes, put your phone away. Watch the movie. No. Like, he gets okay, all, Dad. He gets angry when I don't uh, pay attention to his movie that he loves. So, I mean, it drives me mental, but he gets so angry. So, um, all right. Good that job. would be one thing. Okay, that's great. Uh, another one of your close friends is Mark Shifley. Take us back to the conversation when Mark told you that he had signed the extension um, on his latest contract. Yeah, it was uh, exciting, obviously big for the organization. Um, you know, a key piece like that. He's been here for a long time and just, you know, coming up into free agency and to be able to sign him and Bucky was huge for us. And, you know, uh, it says a lot about the team, says a lot about the organization and, um, just great for our team as a, to go forward in the future. So I think, uh, you know, everyone was pretty excited and everyone was, was very happy and it was a big step for our team. Um, lots of things you just mentioned, some of the things you do away from the ice. Uh, I, we had Dean Stewart from the Manitoba Moose on, and uh, Jeff Millad as well, talked about Catan and how big it was and how big it is for off the ice uh, for the Moose. Uh, he, he said that, Dean Stewart said that he, you introduced him to it. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. go with, down that role. Yeah, I got introduced from actually Kovacevic and Malat and those guys that my first that year with the Moose we played Catan and um, I got introduced to the game and then I f loved it and then when we went to Penticton for that uh, rookie tournament um, you know there was stuff to do but not tons to do so we yeah. spent a lot of time but the weather together. wasn't that good when we were there that no time, exactly yeah. Yeah. so we were spending a lot of time together in one one in one person's room and playing Catan on the iPad and um so that was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah do you it's still a great game. do you still do it at all? And, I play. I haven't played in a long time. I mean, I play with my family in the summer. My family likes it. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't played. No, no one on the on the team really here Dude, plays time. it. Okay. So I haven't played it since mm -hmm. the summer. But you know, the guys in the Moose they love it. We were played all the time, so yeah. it's good stuff. It gets quite heated too, yeah, as well. It's very now. Is it is it better in your mind on the on the iPad or on the, with the board game? Uh, it just depends. Yeah, iPads. I feel like iPad's probably a little bit quicker mm -hmm. just because everything happens right away. And, and um, it's a little bit of a different game. Like, it looks different, but everything, like, the concept and everything's the same. I don't know. I like, I like the iPad, but the board game's still the best, I think. It's way more heated, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it's still better. Yeah. But it's just a little slower. <laughs> Which is obviously we've learned from you. Not good. Yeah, I like, yeah. I like, yeah, exactly. Gets, let's get I don't moving have the here. patience. <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time and having some patience to do this. Appreciate it. Good luck the rest yeah. of the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hi, I'm Nino Niederreiter. Peter Reiter, the side of the net, he scores! And this is the Ground Control Podcast. Great stuff from Cole Perfetti. Uh, looking forward to seeing how their relationship uh, well, transpires or continues to go on here as roommates. We all have had roommates where we battle with, but of course we love to be around. And that is certainly the case with Dylan Sandberg and Cole Perfetti. Uh, still to come, Brock McGillis. He was just in Winnipeg before the end of 2023 on his Culture Shift Tour. A talented speaker and his work should not go unnoticed. Uh, he will be back on the road on January 8th in Montreal. But first... Let's go to the final play of the week of 2023. Many thanks to Vladislav Nemesnikov and his seeing eye shot in St. Paul. Schmidt, Perfetti, the second Stripping unit to start. He swings it to the corner. Nemesnikov gets skating, shoots and scores! Vlad Nemesnikov, a seeing eye shot. A power play goal has us tied at two. Brock, I, I know you didn't really want to talk about this, but you were a, a goaltender at one time. So, I mean, let's go over that whole part of your life because, as we know, goaltenders are a little odd. Um, what, what got you down that path? Um, I, I just want to preface this by saying I no longer identify as one. <laughs> yes. So, um, I, I think I'm a little less odd now. But, um, I... It's funny enough. I'm from a small. I'm from Sudbury, but I lived in a small town outside of it for a while. And and I think it was like Tyke or something. My dad would bring me to the rink at like six a.m. and I would give players my shifts. Yeah, I'd let them go in front of me to go up next. And then one kid broke his helmet, and I gave my helmet to him. So my dad came and got You're me. You're very giving the guy. Obviously. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm so generous. <laughs> yeah, obviously. And. <laughs> My dad, not happy that he's up at five to bring me to hockey. Um, uh, you take the up. shift. I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thrilled, right? <laughs> he's sitting in the stands. It's 
freezing cold, yeah. 6 a.m. And he came and got me off the bench and took me home. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? Like, what was that? And I said, I want to be a goalie. So he actually took me, he's, we had tickets to the Wolves game, every Wolves. And he's like, all right, tonight at the Wolves game, I want you to give me three good reasons why you want to be a goalie. And I did. Yeah. Do you remember those three reasons I at do. all? Okay, let's hit them. Hit me uh, with those. The first one, the equipment's cool. Absolutely. The second one is everyone cheers for you when you make a save. And my love for attention, you know, came through. And the third one was that your teammates come and congratulate you after the game. You came up with those reasons at, at like a young age. Six or seven. So I've always been a narcissist who loved attention and nice things. <laughs> <laughs> and goaltending equipment is the nice thing. So. Yeah. So from six on, you were a goaltender. I was. Yeah. And what, what did mom and dad think of that whole, obviously your dad was good with it because of the reasoning behind it. But how about this, Brock? How shocked was your dad when you were, had the th those, those three reasons set and ready to go? I don't remember <laughs> his reaction, but I became a goalie. So yeah, obviously he was impressed with, with the answers. Yeah. Your presentation was excellent. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So I started young. Now, now I'm doing it for a living. Okay, when was the last time you put on the pads? Uh, Pre-pandemic. Yeah. I, I was skating. There's a skate in Toronto every Saturday morning, and it was actually started by a bunch of people from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. And I would skate with them. It was a bunch of executives, and then there are employees who are ex-pro hockey players, and my brother was skating in it, and, and he got me in. So I was skating with them and then the city gave away, it was 25 year standing skate and the city gave away the ice at, after the pandemic. Wow. I know. That's, that's something else. And yeah. do you miss it at all? Like, is there any part of you at all that like, would like to go back and, and you, you think about it as one time, like, I'm going to do this again. I think at some point I would like to, it's just my travel schedule mm -hmm. is so yeah, we're gonna get to that. ridiculous that I just, I can't, I feel bad being the goalie because you have to like, a player can show up or not show up and nobody like, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's not the end of the world, but as a goalie, if you don't show up, it's tough and being away for like months at a time, it's, it's pretty difficult, but I don't miss, uh, I've had season ending injuries every year from 15 until I retired and, yeah. and I don't miss the pain I'd be in on Sundays, Yeah, <laughs> but uh, after the Saturday skate, but other than that, yeah, I, I, I miss being out there. I, I miss the ice. I, I miss the smell of the rink and, mm. and all that fun stuff. Uh, so now that you haven't been playing goal, how is the body, is the body healed enough where you're not feeling the aches and pains that you had from your, from your career? I'm pretty diligent with my uh, rehab stuff and, mm. and my workouts to make sure I'm feeling good. So the body feels a lot better, although this travel schedule hasn't been kind to it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's definitely a lot better than, than it was. What day did you wake up and decide you wanted to make a difference that, the way you have now? Ooh, it sort of happened in, in, in increments. Mm -hmm. The first one was I uh, became friends with Brendan Burke, Brian Burke's son. Yeah. And he would talk about activism and advocacy and, and making hockey a place that is welcoming for LGBTQ plus people and shifting narratives around it. And that was the first time it was ever in my mind and I was still a closeted hockey player at that point. And um, after he passed, I came out, the last message he sent to me was two days before he passed away. He said, I can't wait for the day that you're out to your family like I am to mine. Mm -hmm. And I ended up telling my family after he passed to honor him. And then years later, I had retired from playing and I was working with athletes. I was doing off-ice training on a skill development with about 100 players. And I was hiding my sexuality from them. I was out of my private life, but I was hiding it from them. Mm -hmm. And I came to find out they all knew. I got a phone call from a hockey mom one day and she said, uh, I want to set you up on a date. And I said, what's her name? And she said, Steve. Okay. Yes. So was that a relief though, that somebody that people knew? Uh, no, I panicked. Yeah. I was like, they're not going to want to work with me. They're not going to want to train. I employed people They're mm -hmm. uh, they're going to lose their jobs. What am I going to do? But then I realized they all know I'm gay and choose to work with me in Sudbury, Ontario, where there isn't a ton of exposure to the LGBTQ plus community. It's pretty cool. I started to observe their behaviors and I started to notice anytime they'd say something homophobic and mm -hmm. listen, our culture has racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist language, like that's just reality. And when they would say something homophobic, they'd freeze up and apologize. I'd be like, cool, maybe we're creating a shift here. Mm -hmm. 
And then I was like, or maybe they just like me. Yeah, right. I, I adhere to the norms. I present like a hockey bro. Maybe they just like me, but maybe they go to school, the rink, parties, wherever, and they're, they're using slurs. One day I wasn't there and I had a sprint coach working some athletes on a track. And at the end of a two-hour workout, he told them they had 10 more sprints. The younger player said, this is so gay. Mm-hmm. And an older player already in the OHL about to go pro looked at him and said, we don't say that here. Okay. Give me, give me 50 push-ups. That became something my athletes adopted amongst themselves and then took it to their friends at school, their teammates, younger players. And before I knew it, people I didn't know were doing push-ups. The younger player, one of his teammates one night was on FaceTime with his girlfriend. And his girlfriend says, let's hang out. And he says, no, I can't, I have practice. And she says, that's okay, you never wanna hang out with me. And he looked at her and said, give me 50 push-ups, we're breaking up. Right. And they both dropped down and FaceTime did push-ups. And that's when I knew that I can be a part of the shift and we could evolve this culture and we can make it better. And, and, and if we make this culture better, society will be better too because hockey influences Canadian society. It totally does. And it, it must have been heartwarming in some ways that that happened as quickly as it did with the people around you. Yeah, it was such a relief and it was so exciting. But I, overwhelming in some ways? Coming out was. Yeah, at, of at that point, it wasn't because I hadn't told them so like Mm -hmm. they knew and I knew they knew but it was like one of those unkept secrets right like we all knew what was going on we just didn't talk about it Mm -hmm. and now so now did you ever think at that moment that this would blow up the way it has no even when I came out there's a a couple other things that sparked it some pulse nightclub tragedy Uh, a friend of mine was targeted uh, and and some stuff in hockey and I just said, I'm done, I'm coming out. And I wrote an article coming out in Yahoo Sports in 2016, and I did it for me. I thought maybe it'd help a couple of people. Um, that first day I received over 10,000 messages from people all over the world. Okay, that's gotta be overwhelming. That was the most intense day of my life. Yeah. Um, 90% were positive, 10% were people struggling. And then I started getting calls from media across Canada, the US, the world, and then calls to speak. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm a speaker now. Did you, okay, so you're clearly a very good speaker. Were you able to speak as well as you do now about things or you've obviously evolved over time here and gotten better at what you do? I think I was always good at it. Mm-hmm. I think it was, it, it came naturally to me. I love, I've loved attention since I was a little goalie. Um, so it, it was never something where I was like, mm, I'm, I'm nervous, I, I'm afraid to do this. I, like a lot of people, that's their biggest fear is public speaking. Public speaking is terrifying. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I just absolutely love it. So at first I was nervous, but it wasn't like, I don't want to do this nervous. It was like, can I remember my life? And once I got that down and I've evolved what I say a little bit throughout time and like tweaked it here and there, now it's just like a well-oiled machine. I can go in and boom, it's it's done. But it's definitely improved, but I was always confident and comfortable doing it. Yeah, you can tell that you're very comfortable speaking. So now that you're moving around the country and you're getting consistent you know, demands on your schedule, this is very similar to a junior hockey schedule, would you not? Like you're used to this type of life, moving around, not sure where you are some nights, what you have said, what you have done. But this, this is really cool, Brock. What is going on here? Yeah, um, I had this idea. I think I'm a masochist. <laughs> because I just decided like, let's go to a hundred minor hockey teams in a hundred days across Canada. Yeah. And it's like, sure. Like who, who decides to do that? And I was like, oh, it'll be no problem. And then I haven't slept in a month and a half. And now I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe I should rethink my life decisions. <laughs> yeah. I got this 2024, maybe spread it out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but I'm already like next year, I want to do one in Canada and one in the U.S. Okay. So I'm, I'm putting more on my plate. Yeah. I, I so just, that, that whole idea of 2024 less is not going to go. Yeah. Like, yeah. That, that New Year's resolution is out the window already. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I don't know how to turn it off, but right. It's been wild. Like, yeah. like days are long. Some days I'm up at four and I'm back home to eat dinner at a hotel at midnight. And it's just intense, but it's been incredibly positive and surreal. And, and yeah, I don't know where I am some days. I, 
I have my tour manager. I'm like, can you just prop me up and like whisper the speech behind me? Like just, just say it and yeah. like, pretend I'm there. I can be a little puppet, but who's your tour manager? Gotta uh, give him credit. Dom Granado, Tony's son, Don's nephew mm -hmm. and Cammy's nephew. And right. Godchild. So how did you guys become, become friends? And then how did he become your tour manager? Well, funny enough. So, so Dom is a graphic designer and he's very talented, but, uh, how we first met was, uh, Justin and last names are escaping me right now. Uh, the the athletic trainer for the Seattle Kraken is gay. Okay, and we know each other. And then I saw somebody on his Instagram story with the last name Granado, and I just said, "Oh, is he related to Cami?" I, I didn't think of Tony or Don. I went right to Cami, which a lot of Granados. Yes, yeah. but but also he found that really cool that <laughs> I, I you know and. He's like, yeah, that's Cammy's nephew. That's Tony's son. I'm like, oh. And he's like, yeah, he's gay too. And he played junior hockey and he played NCAA. I'm like, oh, how didn't I know this? <laughs> so I reached out to him and uh, he, when he was playing and not out, read my story when I had first come out. Mm -hmm. And I think it was part of his coming out process. And we formed a friendship and he's, uh, he works for himself. He's fr a freelance graphic designer. So I was like, you should come on this tour. I think of all people I know, like you're talented with socials and this and that, and we filmed the whole thing. I'm like, this, this is something I think you'd appreciate. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. So he's, uh, he's. So from that point on, he was your tour manager basically. For this yeah. tour itself, the yeah. hundred and a hundred. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, I'm in. And, uh, we've been working together on it since. Okay. Well. I want this to be a positive spin, but has there been a day or days or weeks where you're like, okay, this is this isn't working? With Dom? Or no, I mean I mean oh. with the message you're trying to get across. Not the shift. A, okay, I'm gonna tell you, not on this tour. Okay. It's blown my mind. Right. Like I actually anticipated, you know, pushback, this, that, you know, maybe some protesters or whatever. It's uh, we were in Vancouver and we were doing the whole Vancouver region to start. And I received an email from a hockey mom. And she said, um, you spoke to my son's friend's team. And the friend had come over and told her that I changed the way he saw the world. Okay. And I might have changed oh, his life. That's fantastic. We've had between coaches and players, at least six or seven people come out mm -hmm. to me. Um, we had an incident. There was, there was an incident of um, hate crime of sorts committed on a player in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess it happened on the Saturday and we came in the, the following Wednesday. The timing and was really good, obviously, it, right? It just so happened. Mm -hmm. Like it was all coincidence. And this boy comes up to me after and he's in tears. And I think he's about to come out to me. Like, mm -hmm. And he's like, I, this happened to me on the weekend and you've inspired me to tell my teammates how it made me feel. Okay. And he's 14 years old. So I'm like, so I pulled the coach aside and nobody else in the room. I'm like, when's your next practice? It's like Friday. I'm like, I'm coming back. So we actually went back in and I worked with the boy and his mom to facilitate and, and to You were in the up. room when he, when he told his teammates how they made him feel. Yeah. And okay. what they did. And I got to talk a bit about what they did and the impact and blah, blah, blah. And then he stood up and shared. And it's arguably one of the most courageous things I've seen in a men's hockey locker room ever. Yeah. That's. That's amazing. So what was the response from his teammates? We were leaving because it was, wasn't scheduled and I had to go to another arena right away to, to go speak to another team. But as we were walking out the, uh, of the locker room, they were all starting to line up to go over and talk to him. Okay. And I followed up with his mom and she said, he's a little concerned because they're being almost too nice now. Yeah. Which there's, is natural, I think. There's an overcorrection, yeah. totally. Yeah, that's that's human nature to overcorrect in some ways, especially when you've made somebody feel that way. So, um, so switching to the positive side of things, how how much is the shift? What have you noticed in the shift so far in your time on this tour? And are we headed in the right direction? I mean, the fact this tour exists is a shift. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I don't think five years ago or seven years ago when I first started doing this work, this would have happened. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's an evolution and listen, yeah, I'm gay and yes, I'm talking about LGBTQ plus, but what I'm really talking about is creating shift makers. And 
that shift can be anything. You know, that hockey player in Sudbury telling another hockey player gave me 50 push-ups. Yeah. That was, that was a sh moment. That was a shift. Mm -hmm. And those shifts, big or small, like he thought it was something simple, you know, on a track in Sudbury. That had a ripple effect. That's the reason why I'm here talking to you right now. Right. It made me realize what I could do. It made me realize so much. It saved, like, I've had thousands of people come to me who were struggling and in some cases, like, like on the brink of, you know, self-harm or worse. And been able to get them life-saving support right and it's because of that kid you know those shifts big or small have a ripple effect and they can change the world yeah and and pick the topic racism homophobia sexism ableism mental health cancer it doesn't matter what it is mm -hmm. the shifts are still shifts yeah so it's i think it's been incredible to see and and how engaged the kids are like like i do this breakout i don't know if you've noticed but there's a lot of conformity in hockey. <laughs> um, I can pick out a hockey player anywhere I go. We dress the same, talk the same, walk the same. Yeah. I, I mean, I was joking with you before we started that I should have wore a Jets hoodie and a hat because every player you've had on has worn the exact same thing. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> uh, and, and that's normal because we spend so much time in the space. Mm -hmm. But it's not who they are. There's more to them. There's more depth. And we don't bring it in men's hockey. We're allowed to talk about women, video games, partying, and sports. There's more. T Are there more conversations happening now? We start, like, I've done this with NHL teams mm -hmm. where I've had players stand up and say, you know, I like writing poetry. Mm -hmm. I love to paint. And we're doing this at younger ages, too. And I'm seeing, like, in Calgary, like, 10 players stuck around to talk to me for an hour. They One of them makes candles. A AAA hockey player. Like, he would have been... 10 years ago, he would have been ostracized. He would have been sure. the gay guy. He would have been called every name in the book. Mm -hmm. Now six of his teammates are, like one kid makes them, six or seven of the teammates uh, sell them. Yeah. Well, you can, the candle business is very lucrative. So I can Especially see. Especially holidays. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> prime time. This, this is the right time. I bought time. five. That's, yeah. I, I was traveling around the country was with there five a candles. For five? <laughs> no, no. But I was like, here, here's my debit card. Just... <laughs> Charge, just give just, me yeah. whatever scent, whatever scent there is. So just looking at stuff like that and having these breakouts where they share things they wouldn't typically tell teammates. Like they call themselves families or brothers mm -hmm. and, and yet they only talk about four things. And I'm like, my family knows more about me than that. Yeah. And there's more to us. And then the more we recognize our differences and embrace them, the less likely we are to judge others for theirs. So not necessarily... Like the more people find out about players, and I'm not just talking like, and I'm talking NHL players, it humanizes them, and that's something that has gone away since salaries have gone to the place they are. Hockey players have been NHL players have been it's been un unable to be viewed as humans in some ways. They're little hockey robots. Yeah, and and my goal is to humanize the live experience of a queer person, but also to get them to be more human. Mm -hmm. um, and. I would argue that salaries would go up higher if they showed more personality. Right. Which is something that, you know, a lot of agents have been saying to be able, you know, unfortunately, because they wear, you guys wear helmets and everything is hard to, for people to see the person. So they, they need to do it here. Yeah. They need to do it on social media. They need to embrace more. Like every hockey interview between periods sounds the same. Mm -hmm. Pucks in deep, back check card, <laughs> play yeah. for the logo on the front, blah, yeah. blah, blah. It's like... And but, it's those, those are let's say this. That's unfair at that moment to interview a player because you're in the middle of a game. To go outside of that makes it challenging, right? I mean, or questions I, can I, change. I think questions can change, but we've also seen in other sports where mm -hmm. players step out. Yeah, you know, like look at basketball players. Totally, and they're making best like, example. Uh, you know. Damian Lillard's making sixty million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. There's backups in the NBA making more than Connor McDavid. Right, and it's like, well, maybe we should pull more because these guys have it. Yes, they do. They have the personality. I've hung out with. I've been around the game my entire life. I've been in those locker rooms. Yeah. I know. They just need if they show more of it. I think it would be good for their bank accounts. I think it would grow the sport. I I think it would create safer environments for, for people that can't fully conform to the culture. One last one for you before you go. Every day that you wake up, do you realize what you, what you have created and what you're starting and what you're continuing to do? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think I'll take pause 
once this tour is over and go, yeah. wow. But ultimately, no. I mean, I, I'm just one of those people that's never satisfied. Mm-hmm. So, Clearly. <laughs> so regardless of what I do, I'm like, okay, what's next? And what more can I do? And how can we evolve this, that, or the other? And, and in sport, out of sport, I, I'm always thinking of new ways to challenge myself and challenge the culture. So there's work to be done. And until I don't have to do this work, I just keep pushing. Well, thanks for everything you're doing. And thanks for this conversation. It's been, it's been fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you for amplifying. Truly, I appreciate it. Thanks to Brock. Uh, go to his website right now, brockmcgillis.com, for more information on his tour and the culture shift. And, of course, our thanks to Winnipeg Jet forward Cole Perfetti for joining us as well. Thank you so much for watching or listening. I'm Jamie Thomas. This is Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. We'll see you next week.